It is interesting times at the moment. And I think uh, for a lot of property people or potentially people out in the marketplace, they're a little bit rattled because every time you sort of turn on the TV, there's someone striking, someone uh, torching a car, there's something bad happening in the world. Uh, so my first tip when it comes to all this nonsense, just turn the noise down, uh, buy a property and go and learn to play golf. In fact, that should be probably the end of the podcast because the easiest way to become wealthy out of real estate is to not even listen to some of the conversations around economics. Just buy the stuff, leave it alone and come back 20 years from now. Welcome to the Urban Property Investor. I'm your host, Sam Saggers, here to help you crack the code of real estate wealth. Today's show, a code cracker. I'll tell you what, we have been through a once-in-a-lifetime economic change. It's created lots of issues, lots of opportunities, but what is the outlook? Today, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what is going on, where we see some golden outlooks that you no doubt need to understand to tackle this thing called property investment. So it's going to be a mastermind session today. Hey, uh, this is the first, uh, if this is your first time tuning into the show, welcome aboard. Make sure you play the program in double speed, get your life back. And of course, all the episodes and shows I've done are lessons on real estate. So feel free to go back in time if that rocks your boat. Hey, this is the earliest show I think I've ever done. It's about five in the morning. And uh, I'm surprised my brain is working. But as Gopnik say, the early bird gets to wear the shoes of the household. So I tell you what, uh, perhaps I'm an early bird. And as we would say in modern English, maybe I'll catch the worm. Gopniks get to wear shoes. We get to catch worms. What's going on with the real estate market? What's going on with the Australian economy? Hey, uh, I tell you what, um, you know, it is interesting times at the moment. And I think uh, for a lot of property people or potentially people out in the marketplace, they're a little bit rattled because every time you sort of turn on the TV, there's someone striking, someone uh, torching a car, there's something bad happening in the world. Uh, so my first tip when it comes to all this nonsense, just turn the noise down, uh, buy a property and go and learn to play golf. In fact, that should be probably the end of the podcast because the easiest way to become wealthy out of real estate is to not even listen to some of the conversations around economics. Just buy the stuff, leave it alone and come back 20 years from now. But human beings are addicted to dopamine. We love the idea of learning and and uh, seeing what's happening out in the marketplace and things do frighten a lot of people. So we'll go over some of the key issues for the economy, which are key issues today in 2022 and will flow into 2023. And of course, those key issues, if you like, are inflation. Uh, we will hit a 30-year high when it comes to headline inflation. Uh, it is on its way past 7%, which is huge. Like we haven't seen that in uh, over three decades. So for a lot of people, particularly probably people uh, who are millennials, uh, you've potentially never seen uh, higher inflation rates out in the market. I remember when I was growing up, uh, it was very common to have these uh, sayings like, um, you know, you need to live within your means. Don't uh, you know, don't live beyond your means. And um, again, a lot of that stuff is why I guess almost like baby boomers and Gen Xs are shaped a little bit differently when it comes to the money conversation. Because when uh, we were sort of in our, you know, younger years, I guess it was very, very common for uh money to be less abundant than what it is today. And so it's an interesting space because inflation with it brings a little bit of belt tightening. And of course, a lot of society 
has never necessarily had to tighten their belts. We live in a consumerist society, so the more we consume, um, the more GDP and output is created. And so we're encouraged to spend. Um, economics in Australia is about spending. And so I think over the last decade or so, we've become you know, rather strange spenders in a way. You know, we'll buy a pair of shoes, it's not quite right, chuck it in the bin, buy another pair. It's all been sort of cheap and uh, and almost there's been this kind of abundancy out in society. And of course, uh, you know, as Gopnik say, the early bird gets to wear the shoes because, uh, you know, in many places, money is still tight and it's uh, you can't sort of behave like that. So we're certainly uh, drifting into a different place where, you know, perhaps we have to be a little bit more responsible around money management. And I think that's a good thing because the more you can be responsible around money, the more you'll probably take interest into the actual value and worth of money. And if anything, inflation will teach people once again the value of money, which has fundamentally been worthless for a very, very long time. So that in itself, I think is pretty good. And of course, uh, interest rates will keep rising over you know, the short-term period will probably sit in a very interesting interest rate place for the decade ahead. Nothing too high, but certainly we're not going to be in a wartime interest rate environment such as what was created through the pandemic. The good news is the economy is pretty strong though. Like you've got to say, uh, with the absence of workers, uh, unemployment is very, very low, very low. Uh, we are at a 50 year low, 50 years. You have to go back 50 years. Uh, what is that? 1970s. And, uh, unemployment was, uh, this low. So pretty incredible set of dynamics unfolding, but inflation is taking off around the world. And we know some headline inflation now, the US is over 8%. We know that the European Union is similar, the United Kingdom, very, very similar, Canada, similar. And then of course, some of the great Asian countries, China, Japan, um, high, but by their standards, very, very, uh, you know, you know, not high by world standards, you know, you're two and a half percent in Japan. Japan's had basically zero inflation for three decades. So, uh, you know, um, it is interesting. Australia, a little bit lower when it comes to world inflation, um, headline inflation at 5%, really headed probably a little bit higher. And uh, what that is going to do is obviously put running pressures on businesses. So the cost to run a business is going to jump, right? And again, like if food costs more, if uh, petrol costs more, if everything costs more, then at some point that supply cost has to evolve and fundamentally put on the price of something. And we have been through such a long time of deflation. Things have become worthless and all really inflation does is restore the true value of something back to what it should be worth. You know, we probably, if we were honest about it, should not live in a society where we throw away stuff. Like we are living and deflation created that deflation created a throwaway society. Like in, in reality, we should buy quality goods, hold on to them. And, and, but we are in a society which is driven by consumer spending, right? So it's interesting because we go through these periods where um, things inflate, but then a technology comes along and almost like cools the inflation. And you think about, you know, Um, what technology does to inflation. It brings it back. And we are living in a technical age. We are living in a digital age. We are living in an age where the speed of change is transformative. And again, like if you think about, you know, uh, just like, I don't know, like 
a television, right? You know, a television back in the day was a cumbersome thing. You know, it was huge. It was slow moving. And all of a sudden, how we watch TV, you don't even need a TV. You can watch a TV through an iPhone. So again, like the way, um, what that does to to uh, the cost of things is, it, again, distorts them, changes the value, pushes the value down. Um, all of a sudden, you know, one object can do five different things. So um, we're living in, a, in an environment where even though inflation, I guess, is considered to be on the move, you know, we're not back in the 1960s where like, like there wasn't stuff. So what I'm trying to allude to is even though inflation's out there, we live in an, in an advanced society which is almost like better equipped to deal with inflationary situations because more of what we have actually provides more of what we need, which is an interesting, interesting dynamic. But it is fair to say we uh, are going to see things cost more. And, um, you know, for a long time, the powers that be have preached that this is transitory. Uh, again, these are the people that, you know, are in charge of the economy. And, you know, I don't know uh, why they've been preaching to us that this is transitory when this is this is not so transitory. This is going to stick around for a little bit. So, I'll let you decide why that happens behind the scenes, but um, the reality is uh, we're we're going to deal with this thing called inflation. Um, but I think the modern economies are quite equipped to deal with this thing called inflation, which uh, which is quite interesting. But businesses, some businesses are going to have to pass some costs on to. Uh, consumers. And when you think about it, some things cost a lot, right? Like a lettuce, you know, is costing like $7 for a, for a basically something which is just water. Um, you know, and you think about that, right? For a, for a restaurateur, and I was, I was watching a restaurateur talk about lettuce, right? Um, on uh, TikTok. And, you know, you're sort of saying, well, I mean, how do you pass the cost of lettuce on to a consumer? So, like, you can't, right? It's a stupid thing. You either remove the lettuce or you, um, you know, or you, or you, uh, you know, or you absorb the cost as the business, right? And so, um, you know, to buy a box of lettuce for that business is like $200. It, it makes no sense. They're just using a little bit of it to put on a, on a burger, um, so, you know, this is where, um, again, like we're going to start to see, um, society, you know, have to deal with some of these inflationary things. And again, inflation just restores the actual true cost of something and things have been too cheap. Technology changes and, and distorts it, but also technology for the most part is also, an improver of what things cost. And again, like I could go back to the iPad, right? Like I can watch TV on it. I can use it as a computer. I can use it as a, as a, um, a camera. Um, I can teleconference on it. Um, it's a telephone. It's like, like that one piece of thing, actually that one little object, an iPad, and I'm just using this as an example, you know, like from an inflation point of view, saves thousands because you're not spending, you don't need 20 different things. You just need the one. And again, technology um, and the time we're living in is not being taken into the consideration of, of the cost of goods and services. And I think, you know, 30 years ago, if that was uh, that's the last time we kind of saw this time of inflationary, it was a long time ago, you know, there wasn't a, you know, it, it, you, you were dealing with a lot more moving parts, um, certainly. So what we do know, though, is business confidence is actually pretty solid. Like there's, there's a lot of uh, good conditions for business at the moment. And while se seemingly we live in a volatile period, business conditions and confidence levels are generally pretty positive. Um, firms 
are running uh, into some constraints, like businesses are, are running into supply chain constraints, but mainly, you know, things are holding pretty, uh, pretty firm out in the marketplace. And again, when we look at the labor market, um, it's in fairly unique a fairly unique position. It's it's literally the lowest unemployment rate since 1974, and it could get lower. Um, workers, I mean, probably the biggest problem for businesses is retaining talent and finding new talent. Um, to grow a business, to scale your business, you know, businesses need uh, output, and a lot of that output comes from talent. And if you can't find talent, then uh, talent becomes, you know, a commodity. And this is where potentially, you know, we are going to see off the back of the current market conditions, uh, potentially for the right skilled person in the economy, they potentially could be earning more very, very soon. And again, like, um, you know, a lot of this is to do with, um, yeah, closed borders, the pandemic. I mean, really, if we were to look at the result of the pandemic, the way we approached the pandemic, the way the world approached the pandemic, I mean, this this is this is the aftershock, right? This is what we're going through. So for businesses, you know, one of the things that may unfold and is already unfolding is they're increasing their prices of their costs and goods. And um, not all businesses can absorb the lettuce. So uh, margins need to be maintained. And of course, this is going to mean for the household budget, there are choices to be made, right? And, um, you know, again, going back to when I grew up, you know, we had the saying, you know, that person spends beyond their means, that household spends beyond their means. Don't spend beyond your means because you've got a household budget to run. Where is the money likely to go to and what um, what fundamentally needs to be thought through in a better fashion. And I think, you know, for the most part, disposable income around Australia still very, very strong. Um, however, may just mean that people aren't, um, you know, spending as much as they normally have on dumb stuff. Like I'm a dumb spender. I love going on Kogan and, you know, buying uh, dumb shit and, you know, if I had a financial constraint, like that would be the first thing to go, right? That would be the first thing to to um, disappear. Um, so obviously during COVID, there were two falls in GDP and a lot of them were based on the lockdowns, right? And so Australia prior to the pandemic and the lockdowns hadn't had a recession for a very, very long time. Technically, we had a recession during the lockdowns because we had some negative quarters of growth. However, since then, uh, and since the stimulus has come into the economy, we've actually had a booming economy and that creates in itself uh, more um demand then there is supply of stuff and of course this in itself creates uh creates inflation so though we often see inflation as as an evil thing it is actually also a sign that economics can be very very good and so the argument at the moment is well is economics very good or is the world just shot to pieces you got wars you've got supply chain issues You've got, um, you know, certain countries still playing lockdown games with this, uh, with the pandemic, you know, uh, is the world just shot to pieces, right? Um, and there's a little bit of both, really. You're sort of blending the two worlds. You've got, um, you know, business, business conditions quite favorable for the time being, and you've got um, certainly uh, some extraordinary events. Uh, pandemic still happening in certain places, wars. Um, and of course, a lot of this has, again, created opportunity, like the true worth of things that are being explained, right? And like 
Netflix, as we all are saying, is not worth anything. It's not. Um, you know, a lot of stocks that are worth, that are just speculation or, or future technologies, they're, they're not worth something today. Uh, and I think the Gopniks can teach us something. You know, uh, the early bird gets to wear the shoes and that's what really this economy is about. The early bird gets to actually wear the shoes. It's just, it's, I tell you what, I've just worked it out uh, because the Gopniks are true in this, this. This is true. The Gopniks have worked this out because when you think about it, right, what do we actually want to pay for? We want to pay for heating. We want to pay for housing. We want to pay for food. The Gopniks have got this worked out. The early bird gets to wear the shoes. The early bird doesn't need the other stuff, right? They just need the shoes. And this is where we find ourselves today. And really, I learned this from a demographer that I saw speak, oh, I don't know, it's 2016, uh, Bernard Salt, that like in an inflationary environment, the only thing that matters is food, security, energy, space, like housing, water, um, and resources. So in a, in a deflationary environment where things cost nothing, like this is where you see worthless things being invested in. And, you know, I don't want to get into the crypto kind of conversation, but, you know, and I've invested in crypto, but... Um, it fundamentally is not something you need to survive, right? Um, it's it's got its own sort of logic around it, and you know, you know, there are fans of fans of that stuff that will probably play a hate me, but um, again, like you know, Netflix, which is an easy thing to understand, contrarian business model, great business model, great in a deflationary environment. In an inflationary environment. Food's running out, food's more expensive, security is a big concern, energy uh, is running out, energy is more expensive, there's nowhere for people to live, space is running out, space is more expensive, water's running out, water's more expensive, water's performed better than gold. Resources, um, you know, uh, supply chain issues, um, all that kind of stuff, that is what you invest in. And, you know, I've, I've, I've invested in this stuff. You know, I'm an investor in, in uh, grains, right, in food, food security. Food is uh, like there's more people than there is food. So, um, uh, you know, whilst the share market dived, my food uh, or grain stock, if you like, has risen so much. And so, like, it's... It, this is this is where we come back to the Gopniks, right? The early early Gopnik gets to wear the shoes, and again, like this is the stuff you want to be like controlling now. I'll say it again: if you want to invest and you want to invest outside of real estate, food, security, energy, water, resources, and inside the real estate economy, space, space. Look at industrial real estate, like like. One of the big challenges when it comes to the cost is the delivery of things. There's, there's even in Australia, there's not enough industrial real estate in key locations to lo lo lower the cost of the last mile effect. The last mile effect is just the concept that, you know, things move around. Like we have to take things, you know, uh, you know, you order something online, e-commerce, all that kind of stuff. You know, the space is at a premium. And space inside of real estate is at a premium. You know, I was just looking at an article. Singapore uh, is obviously the world's best economy. It's been the world's best economy for a long time. They know what they're doing over there. They're not, um, you know, a, a strange Gopnik country where, you know, wild things happen. Uh, they are the number one country in the world when it comes to economics. Rents have doubled. You buy you you were renting an apartment half a year ago. That rent has doubled. Space commodities. Uh, Australia, you know, is like is going through this principle. 
because in inflation, property has pricing power. Now, here's the real truth about the property market, that there is more demand than there is supply. In theory, if the property investment community was better organized, in theory, we could all put our rents up $300 tomorrow morning. Every investor in Australia puts their rents up $300 tomorrow. Pricing power. Real estate has pricing power in inflation because the cost of things cost more. So the production of things is uh, created less. So there's less real estate. So if we wanted to, we could do this. And a lot of rents on the, at the moment are obviously skyrocketing in value, which is, which is fantastic. Uh, but if we were better organized, like we as an industry could fight inflation together and just wipe it out. Like the conversation wouldn't, uh, you know, you would, you, you could almost um, have a movement that can, that answers the hedge answers the hedge. So obviously for GDP, retail spending is one of the big drivers, like how we consume, um, what we spend on. And Australia's retail um, is actually pretty strong. Like, um, you know, it's, it's still, people still spending, right? And, you know, this is still the health signals. Like um, there's money out there, even though, you know, um, there will be some belt tightening. Um, I think the other thing we need to consider in this situation is people still want their holiday. Like they missed out for two and a half years. I just came back from holidays. It was expensive. It was ridiculously expensive. The seafood buffet, $165. And like, like, I mean, when you do the seafood buffet, what are you actually getting? You're getting some oysters. You're getting like, I don't know. Like, people are out there, man. Like, they are still going. Like, there's money because the savings during COVID. So, like, there's this balance restoring effect flowing. And, um, you know, certainly where I go, people are like, you know what? I still want to spend because I haven't had a good time in a long time. And that COVID, you know, everyone, all these politicians locking everyone up, um, you know, it's, it's, there's an inertia that needs to be fulfilled and a game. So, you know, consumer sentiment arguably falling um, and uh, spending still still quite high. So go figure, right? Um, how does that kind of work? But certainly I think consumer spending is falling because the media is pushing for consumer spending to fall. To fall. Like obviously, you know, if you turn on the news, like it's, it's it's a bit ugly, right? So, uh, households, though, when you combine the wealth of a household, is very very strong. So, what that fundamentally is is the assets and cash flow of households. It's pretty good. Like when you look at the net wealth of Australians, like it is pretty incredible. Like we are fairly like much like one of the like we are the 13th richest people in on the planet um and so again like having a gopnik wife like i think sometimes we overcomplicate this stuff because there are some shithole countries out there that you know you're lucky um you know to to share a pair of shoes with with the person you live with right so again like this is why i think sometimes we overcomplicate um ourselves in in society altogether. Like, again, going back to what I was saying, buy a property, learn to play golf, don't even look at the property, don't look at the news, just get on with your life. Put a tenant in there, get a tenant who can pay more rent. It's as simple as that when it comes to this kind of stuff. But if we look at the net wealth, assets, financial assets, superannuation assets, um, and of course liabilities, household wealth um, is just so much, so much more than Australian liabilities. So certainly I think um, from an assets and liabilities point of view, Australians are very, very wealthy. That is for sure. And I think the average wealth of an Australian I saw on a McCrindle slide um, was something like $530,000. Like, like 
you're worth five hundred and thirty thousand dollars. Like that is that is incredible. Like the average person out there today. So I tell you what, if you're not worth five hundred and thirty thousand dollars, you got to uh, do something about that because. Um, that, my friends, is the rat race we're in. So the rat race is telling us that the average um, person out there today, um, household wealth, $530,000. Pretty incredible, right? So you got to keep up with that. Um, if you're falling behind, um, you're probably the person who needs to do some investing. That's the truth of the matter, right? You can hide under a rock or you can get out there and invest. So... Um, Certainly when it comes to the property market, it's obviously going to slow because there's been a boom. Um, You can blame inflation, you can blame interest rate rises, but at the end of the day, there's been a boom. Uh, Generally after a boom comes a, uh, you know, period where things normally slow up. That's the process. That's why the boom happens and that's why we have the slow up section of the marketplace. However, when things slow down, history kind of shows us that um, generally there is price movement a few years after the slow up. We'll talk about what that looks like. But when we're talking about the property market cooling, I mean, we are not talking huge amounts here. Like Sydney fell by 1.4% over the last quarter, like 1%. You know, the average house is 1.4 million. So 1% of that is 14 grand. Like we're talking $14,000. The average Australian is worth 530000 So we're not talking a lot. And then obviously, if you look at other marketplaces over the last quarter, pretty much held their own, right? Um, even Adelaide uh, has gone up 5%. So um, people are still making money, right? Um, in certain marketplaces. But... Obviously, I think we can all kind of go down the road that eventually things are going to slow. Things are going to stagnate in all marketplaces. Um, And as a real estate investor, this is not such a bad thing. I mean, if you are a property investor, you know, you get this. Like, it's not year on year growth out in the marketplace and you need some time for the marketplace to heal from the capital growth. And that's, that's a pretty normal workflow of real estate. However, you know, quite often the conversation is, well, will interest rates obviously matching inflation, um, you know, like cause this huge downturn in real estate and, you know, doomsday is that clickbait, you know, the real estate market's going to fall 30%. Um, you know, in the history of the index of Australian real estate, it's, it's, it's never fallen by that amount. And generally, when we track interest rates, if you go to the Australian Bureau of Statistics, slice up the data, you can see that even after previous uh, rate hikes in previous cycles, so you can go back to like 1994, there was an interest rate, um, start of an interest rate cycle. Within five years of that interest rate cycle hike, which occurred in August 1994, you had 21% uh, improvement on property values. You can go to the interest rate cycle where interest rates went up in 1999. Uh, One year after interest rates went up in 1999, you had house prices move by 6.6%. Two years after, 23%. Three, uh, sorry, five years after, 70%. Uh, you can go to the rate hike cycle of May 2002, uh, one year after the first hike. And this was, this was a transformation period, actually, between 2002 to 2008. We had huge, huge inflation, wage growth. Man, it was the mining boom. That was, it was great. Uh, you're paying a lot for money to borrow it or rent it off the bank, but the growth behind that was significant. The economy was doing well. Uh, within one year of the first interest rate hike in May 2002, property values jumped by 18.1%. House price changed two years later, 24%. Five years later, 48%. Then we can go to 
the rate hike which occurred in uh, October 2009, uh, one year after, property values were up 4.4%. This is indexed, so, you know, you're taking Sydney, Melbourne, you know, all of Australia, basically. Um, and within five years after that last hike, property values were up 21%. Now, a lot of that was led in Sydney and Melbourne, um, that previous cycle, um, and uh, however, you know, as as uh, there's a lot of information in there that Australians aren't really fussed by the cost of money. They're more uh, interested in the flow of money. They want to borrow. They want the Australian dream. They want to get out there and buy real estate. They want to be lent money. And um, again, like, if we look at when there has been fluctuations or downturns, it's not the cost of money typically, it's the flow of money. It's when regulators go, we're not going to lend anyone money. And of course, the last downturn where property values went backwards was when APRA stepped in and controlled the bank's lending and of course made it more difficult to service to borrow money. And again, like, um, you know, from a property uh, observer's point of view, like a voyeur, um, that period, a lot of people jumped out of the real estate market, by the way, like people were like freaking out, like, you know, their property went down by 10%, you know, and they were investors and staff and they were like, oh man, this is it. Like the world's ended. Um, they were good time Charlie's man. And I'll, I'll be honest, like, uh, you know, like, uh, you know, I've, I think I've told this story before. I mean, like, you know, uh, certainly someone I helped buy property, got them a $500,000 house in a, one of the best suburbs of Brisbane, uh, you know, went down, went down in value because of the Royal Commission because lending, um, you know, got KO'd, no one could borrow. Uh, then lending opened up and the property doubled in value one year after the gentleman sold the property. I mean, it, it miffs me like why people look at real estate as like this three year experience. It blows my mind. Like don't come into my life, man. Like stay out of my life. Don't ring me and like want to buy a property and need my help. And like, like want three years worth of magic. Like, I don't want to know you stay away from me. Um, I want to work with people that, understand economics over uh, the like like cycles, like cycles. And I teach a 15-year cycle. Anyone who's a good time, Charlie, a speculator, please stay out of my life. I do not want to know you. Do not uh, contact me. I know that sounds harsh, but that's the reality of life. I've got a lot of people contacting me at the moment. And I really, you know, if, if you're a speculator, please go and see a speculation team. I don't know who they are, but they're probably out there. If you're a buy and holder, I'm your guy. Give me a call. So inflation has jumped. Um, and uh, yeah, like obviously it's it's up there, headline inflation, global pressures, labor shortages, wage pressures. Uh, it's it's momenting this thing, right? And uh and a lot of property investors get really wigged out by this. But property is a hedge to inflation. And I'll kind of explain it so you can kind of understand. And it's a little bit difficult at times to understand this because it is, you know, kind of counterintuitive to what we learn as kids. You know, we're told to save money, put it in the bank. Uh, we're told to start a Dolomite account, right? And for a lot of people out there, like they think as per what the banks want them to think like. They become the sheep. Uh, quite often, we work for the banks as uh, inside of real estate. Like, you know, you think about a home loan, it's just debt to the bank for a long period of time. However, you become a property investor it's a completely different angle, right? So just remember this, right? Governments also have debt. Around the world, all governments carry debt. So they, like you, also want inflation to be managed or within a manageable rate. 
Otherwise, you end up having banana republics where, you know, you become Zimbabwe, right? So governments are in this as much as anyone else. Also remember, property is a hedge to inflation. So over time, inflation actually changes the value of debt. Debt, in other words, is actually devalued by inflation. So let me give you an example. Like if you took out a loan uh, back in 2006, you know, you bought a property, it was 300, uh, you know, you borrowed $300,000. Today, borrowing $300,000 is considered like so cheap because properties are way more expensive than that. So a $300,000 loan back in, I don't know, 2006 seemed like a lot then, but now it seems like nothing because the transformation of money and assets have morphed. Um, And it is not seen fundamentally as huge debt. And we could track real estate uh, against inflation back 60, 70 years. And it's always been like this. So inflation actually allows borrowers to pay lenders back with money worth less than what they fundamentally uh, borrowed. So think about that, right? If uh, you were paying back with today's currency um, in compared to the currency of 2006, today's currency, uh, money is distorted. And so you can fundamentally take today's currency and pay back debt on which was borrowed using a previous currency. In other words, back in 2006, 300,000 was a lot of money. Uh, Today, not such a lot of money. So you've, what the lesson here is, is property is a hedge to inflation, but you see the time that needs to travel. That is the hardest part for people to understand. Um, Here's the real truth, like compared to what, right? You will always be losing money when you save. Now, headline inflation, five uh, headed to 7%. So we know what that is. Savings deposit, um, you know, you're at 1.5%. If you fix it and and give away your your liquidity, you can get like 3.5%. So let's just go back to a normal savings account. Let's call it, you know, maybe you can get paid 2% out there, right? Headline inflation, 7%. So you're actually losing 5% in your buying power. And of course, uh, cash fundamentally devalues faster than the interest you're paid. And this is the problem with cash. This is the problem with low risk investment of doing nothing you're losing because you're not keeping up with really the true cost of money. So uh, historically, um, historically, property has beaten inflation. That's just the truth. Of it. Historically, property has beaten inflation. Go and look at the inflation rate over the last 70 years. Uh, then look at the property rate of growth and it smashes inflation. But the other thing is property uh, has a rental return. So it is a dividend asset, which is why in inflationary circumstances, it produces. And so, you know, you quite often see Warren Buffett talk about this, only buy uh, assets which can both grow, but also pay a return. And so, you know, he loves the share market, but also is a fan of the property market because it produces a dividend and it can produce a rise in value. He does not like, for example, assets which are only based on someone else paying more, but there's no cash flow. The cash flow is the hedge against inflation. And as I kind of alluded to earlier, real estate has pricing power Uh, and the reason it's got pricing power is it is a need-based asset. Food at the moment has pricing power. Wheat, grain has pricing power. Petrol has pricing power. Um, it uh, Resources have pricing power. Water has pricing power. Energy has pricing power. Uh, it can mess, 
with the system because it is the fuel of life. Hence why I'm buying pricing power assets. Real estate is a pricing power asset. Now, the only time real estate loses pricing power is when it's oversupplied, when there's too much of it. We are fundamentally in a very undersupplied place at the moment. So as I kind of, as we've seen in Singapore, rents have doubled. Now, again, if we wanted to deal with this problem of inflation as a, like if every property investor listened to me right now and we got together, we can outprice inflation. We can. We, we can all put our rents up on the same day and the market can't do anything about it. Potentially, government will shit itself and like go, what is going on? Uh, but we have pricing power. And this, again, in times of inflation, property and real commodities tend to do pretty good because they got pricing power. Uh, in times like this, um, need-based economies, not want-based commodities, do, do really well. They're really resilient. And again, like we've got to, I don't know, rise above the noise when it comes to this stuff because, you know, if you're just going to kowtow to the marketplace, like you, you're not understanding economics and you're not understanding that real estate is the greatest hedge against inflation. So let's say there's a decade of inflation. What are you going to do? Sit out of the real estate market and wait for it to go away? Um, you're like, you're time of your investment ability is going to diminish if you go and do that because you only work for so many years. So there's a race going on. And uh, again, you need to be part of the race. Remember, there are some great reasons why the real estate market is fundamentally good. The first one, as I've alluded to, I mean, Australians have acquired, acquired a huge amount of wealth. Like the average Australian is actually quite wealthy compared to the rest of the world at the moment. The average Australian, actually $570,000 worth of net worth. Um, I think rates will be low, even though they feel high. Um, and I know that's a weird thing to say. Like, uh, you know, the median long-term rate in Australia has been around 7%. I think we're going to be much lower than that when it comes to the cost to borrow money. Uh, we do see low mortgage stress out there. And the reason we see low mortgage stress out there, like who's stressed with their mortgage at the moment? Like I've not met one person come up to me and go, mate, I'm feeling a bit stressed by this mortgage. No one. Like, I don't know who these people are. Um, and again, you, like when you look at how the breakdown of real estate works in Australia, you got people who own their real estate outright. You got people who've been paying off a mortgage for the last 15 years. You've got property investors and then you've got this small section of the marketplace who are first home buyers who have got into the market maybe um, recently who may become mortgage stress um, people, but no doubt they've got sweat equity that like they could do a second job. There's no, they, do you know any like jobs are out there at the moment? And I think like we need to just put aside like some of this kind of conversation around, um, you know, like, like, there's no work out there. Like there's so much work out there. I think an economy becomes stress when unemployment figures reach a high amount. And so, you know, when I left school, um, it was like 1993 or something. The unemployment rate was 13%. It was 13%. I mean, that in itself was a marketplace. Very, very different. 13% unemployment. Um, it was so hard to get a job. And so when it's hard to get a job, like what happens to you is your overall output as a human being drops. So let's say, um, and this was very common when I was growing up, like you're worth a hundred grand, but the unemployment is 13, 14, 15%. So it's hard to get a job. One out of, you know, one out of 10, two out of 10 people do not have a job. Um, so if you're one of the people who do, does not have a job, you were worth a hundred grand, but then you've, you know, when you look around, there's no job, you got to go and take a job for 70 grand. Um, 
that uh, sets you back so much because what happens is then you're going back into this, how do I get back to where I was? And it can take, you know, it was taking people such a long time back then to get back to where they were, their equilibrium of what they were worth in the marketplace because the marketplace was devaluing them because obviously of the unemployment concept. So if you, when you measure the human productivity rate, it was dropping because back then the unemployment rate was so high. And of course, um, like a lot of people in society have never had that problem. Sure. Wage growth has not been great, but it hasn't gone backwards. Like you haven't seen unemployment figures so bad that your price of your job has gone south we have lived in a bit of a lost decade where people people's wages haven't grown. But I think like like the counter argument to that, of course, is wages haven't gone backwards and they can go backwards. And I know that is hard for many people to under un, to comprehend, particularly millennials who've never seen this before. But it was it was a real thing. So think about that, right? Like you had people who were being devalued by virtue of their job, um, if they were made redundant, the odds of them getting a new job at the same wage was incredibly, incredibly difficult. So uh, certainly where I see it at the moment is we probably will see wage growth, um, even if it's not super exciting wage growth, which is going to solve the problem of you know, what things cost to live, like you are going to live in a very, very, very unemployed, uh, very good jobless rate marketplace. So there's nothing like I could, I don't think one economist in Australia today would go on record and saying they can see an unemployment rate less than 4% shooting up to 12%. Come on. Like, geez, like that is not going to happen. Human beings are not going to be worth less. So uh, obviously supply is ridiculously low around the, the country, hence why property still has pricing power. Like there's no stock. Like I don't know where the stock's coming. Even if people put their property on the market, they've got to go find someone to live. It's one for one. I sell my house, I've got to go buy a house. I sell my house, I've got to go rent a house. So supply only really comes in from new stock and obviously new stock is incredibly low at the moment when it comes to its production rate. And of course, we are trying to battle to get the international migration. You know, I did see one uh, report, first report I've seen of positive migration, of overseas migration coming into the country. Um, we're all sort of going, well, where is, where is, where are these people? You know, I've been out to the airport. I'm like, where are they? Where are the people? Um, you know, I, I, my missus has been overseas and stuff, and I've been like, I'm going to go to the airport early and see how many people bloody people arrive i want to know if people are coming um and you know i was a bit sort of like are these people really coming i don't know like it doesn't seem busy at the airport to me but figures are out um population id has put out some figures and um obviously they're their figures based on what happened a few months ago um but yeah thousands of people pouring in which is great uh, international migration is going to be an absolute battleground around the world, around the world. Like the world is facing a skill shortage, a population shortage. There are huge economies around the world which are basically got too many people that are old and not enough people that are young. The beautiful thing about Australia is we are like the millennials as per the census are now the biggest generation. And of course, they're very, very young. They're very fighting fit to look after the economy. That is very different to many other uh, economies around the world, by the way, where the millennial is not the largest group. And of course, the millennial is, is a perfect group to pay taxes and keep the economy flowing. And of course, if you run out of young people, you've got a problem because old people can't output as much as young people. And of course, um, when it comes to the healthy position of that, we are in such a good place, along with obviously 
uh, people wanting to come and live in Australia. Like how many, like Russia has a problem. Russia um, needs to attract young people. How many young people want to go live in Russia today? None. China has a problem. China has too many old people, not enough young people. Uh, Mess it all up with the one child policy. I mean, how many people want to go live in China today? I don't know. Not not too many, right? Um, how many people want to live in Australia? Plenty. Um, obviously, I think, and I, you know, I was listening to a demographer talk about this, and you know, I've seen this out there. Like, there are countries now throwing money at people to come to them. Come, come. I think uh, uh, Italy is throwing thirty three thousand dollars for a nomad visa. You can be a nomad, go live in Italy, um, in Calabria, Calabria. And they'll give you 33 grand. So there, there's immigration wars coming, I'm telling you. Well, Australia will probably be throwing um, free airfares for people to come here because we, we're missing 2 million people. What does that mean? Pricing power of real estate. We, we've got more, more uh, demand than we have properties, okay? Um, and, of course, that pricing power is putting a healthy premium on the rental market at the moment, which is fantastic. Obviously, um, we've got uh, a bright future when it comes to the transformation of real estate. And, uh, again, when you look at that wealth, it's, uh, a lot of that household wealth is at the top of the funnel with the older people in society, the builders, the late boomers who are a demographic uh, naming convention. If you're not familiar with them, you know, obviously you're probably more familiar with millennials, Gen X, baby boomer. Uh, there's kind of like two baby boomers, if if you like. There's an older version and a younger version. Then there's the builders, the people who built the system. Builders are disappearing. They've got a lot of money. Baby boomers are disappearing. They've got a lot of money. They're, they're passing away. They're leaving, uh, entering maximum life expectancy. And, of course, there's more money coming into the system. Real estate goes up when money comes into the system. And you've seen that around Australia. How that transpires quite often is through uh, population change. So, for example, Tasmania, a lot more people with a lot more money flow into the Apple Isle. Uh, that money brings with it transformation of housing. You've seen, um, you know, Queensland of late do very, very well. A lot of people uh, hated Dan Andrews. They all were like, we hate you, Dan Andrews. You locked us up. So they left. Melbourne and, and they left Sydney and places like this and went to southeast Queensland to live. And the population swell has created a transformation of money coming into those marketplaces. Property values go up. Melbourne and Sydney now becoming attraction magnets for overseas money coming into the country again. Uh, what that does is it puts more money in the system. More money creates opportunity. Opportunity creates value. Value is seen quite often in improvement in property values. This is how the system kind of works, right? So um, we're certainly headed to obviously a higher interest rate environment, but the fundamentals of Australian real estate and the takeaways is we've got a skill shortage uh, while we probably will have weaker property values, uh, we have a very resilient marketplace. We have uh, certainly low unemployment and there is no devaluing of what people are worth. And uh, I think, you know, you will see uh, a chronic un undersupply unfold when it comes to capital city properties. Um, we uh, really are living in an interesting time where, again, the investments of value and, you know, you may be a little sidelined from this, but if if you tr truly want to make money in this decade, it's pretty simple. Food, security, energy, real estate, water, resources. Hey, thanks for tuning in. I'll catch you next time on the urban thanks for tuning in to the urban property investor to never miss an episode make sure you subscribe to the podcast on your favorite app or on youtube and i would love it if you could give the show a rating and share it with your friends and family in between episodes you can always keep in touch with me by connecting on social media over facebook instagram or linkedin 
Until we meet again on the next episode with the Urban Property Investor, take care and bye for now.